All right, chapter 17 is all about thermal properties of materials. Now, when we heat materials up, you already know from general experience that things happen to them. There's things like thermal expansion, they get bigger. Obviously, the temperature arises in it, right? They might melt, they might decompose. Their mechanical properties change. We've been talking about that during with things like recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. Let's dive into these in a little bit greater detail. Let's start with how things heat up. As energy flows into the system, how it heats up. We define this with something called heat capacity. The heat capacity is something you would have seen before in chemistry, and it's defined as this. It's the amount of energy absorbed by a material to produce a unit rise in the temperature. Right. So mathematically, that's C, our heat capacity, is equal to dQ, the change in heat, divided by dt, right, the change in temperature. Now, there's different ways that you can express this. You'll see it written different ways. You can either do it on a per mass basis, this is the specific heat, or on a per mole basis, right? Therefore, the units will either be joules per kilogram Kelvin, if it's specific heat, or joules per mole Kelvin, right? Those are common ways you'll see this written. And then there's two different ways to measure it. You can do it CP or CV. CP is under constant pressure, and CV is under constant volume. So question I have is, which one should be bigger than the other, right? CP or CV? Well, think about it. If you heat something up under constant pressure versus constant volume, if it's constant volume, then you heat it up, and now it's that same shape, right, but at a different temperature. This was at T1, this one's at T2. It's still the same shape. But if it's constant pressure, then the volume is free to expand, right? So if it starts out with this shape, when you heat it up, it's now larger, right? As it goes from T1 to T2. So not only did it get warmer, right? There was that change from T1 to T2, but now look what it also did. It also pushed on its surroundings, right? By expanding, it did work on its surroundings. Therefore, we know that CV, uh, constant volume, will be less than CP. This scenario right here is CP, this one right here is CV, right? Constant pressure means that it can do work on its surroundings. If it's constant volume, it can't do work on its surroundings, so it's going to be slightly less, okay? So if you see those differences, that's what that's referring to. Now, we keep on saying when energy goes into these materials, temperature goes up, but where does that energy go? We know that energy is not created or destroyed in the universe. It's just converted from one form to the other. So what's it getting converted to when it gets absorbed? Well, there's different things that can happen to it. It can be converted to electronic states, right? Meaning that kinetic energy of your free electrons can get higher, right? It gets boosted, right? So your energy, your electrons that were at lower levels can start to occupy higher levels, right? By absorbing this energy, okay? Um, that is a typically a small contribution, by the way. You can get magnetic transitions, right? As the spins go from ordered to random, right? Maybe in your system, all of your magnetic uh, moments were lined up at first, and we'll talk more about this when we get to electronic materials. And then when you heat this material up, these things can break that and they can become oriented in different directions. That would absorb energy to do that. But again, that's a really small component. By far, most energy goes to vibrations, right? The atoms start to vibrate and they absorb energy and they start to vibrate, right? Now they can absorb vibrations and vibrate in different ways, okay? Uh, for example, you can have transverse versus longitudinal vibrations. Uh, we call these optical versus acoustic phonons, okay? So what is this? Well, take a look at this lattice. Shown here, we're sh we've shown you a lattice that has regions of compression, right, and rarefaction. So as a wave came through this material, you can see the wave nature, right? Here's a peak, here's a peak, here's a peak, here's a peak. So it clearly has waves, right? Regions that are compressed and then uncompressed. Um, it's different than the original lattice, right? So these atoms are being pressed together. So the wave is going this way, right? That's the direction of the wave. And yet that's the same direction as the atoms are pressed, uh, right? So that is one type of wave that can be produced, right? That would be an example of a longitudinal wave, right? This is a longitudinal wave. And those are, again, they're defined as the displacement of the atoms are in the same direction as the wave itself. These are what we call sound waves in a material. When you tap on a material and you hear that, that's the longitudinal waves of atoms being pressed through your material uh, by little waves of displacements, right? They uh, travel efficiently through a material. That's why sound travels really efficiently. We call them sound waves because it's this type of wave that's carrying those atomic motions through the material. But that's not the only type of uh, wave that you can get. 
you can also get transverse waves. Transverse is when the displacement is perpendicular to the propagation, right? So in this case, take a look at these three examples. In all those cases, the wave is going, you know, this direction. But look at how the atoms are being displaced. They're not getting displaced along those directions, the same directions wave. They're doing it orthogonal, right? Vertical and straight up and straight down. So they're doing it perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Okay, that's a transverse wave. And you can see that you could you could have many waves all cooperating together, right? These atoms move the most, these ones a little bit less, a little bit less, barely at all, right? Many atoms together could make a wave with a long wavelength. Or you could do it at the atom level, where an individual wave goes down, the next one goes up, then this one goes down, this one goes up. Uh, that's also possible. Because of that, you can see that there's actually a lower limit on the wavelength that you can get with transverse waves. The lower limit of this wavelength is going to be equal to 2 times your interatomic distance. They're calling it D here in this diagram, right? Whatever your interatomic distance is, your smallest wavelength you can get is just going to be two of those, right? By the time you go two of those, you're back where you began again. And then the largest waves that you could get, the largest wavelength is going to be two times the length of your sample, right? Two times this length here. So if your sample would have to be uh, smaller than this, right? So the actual size of your sample will dictate how big that wave can be, right? Okay, now in a material, it's not like there's one wave that's present. There's lots of different waves. There's a distribution of waves that are present. You've got some short wavelength phonons in your material, and you've got some long ones, right? And so because of this phonon distributions, uh, what we need to do is we need to think about energy as being quantized. Each different type of wavelength has a quanta of energy associated with it, okay? Um, another thing to realize is that these phonon waves, in addition to storing energy, they do lots of other really important things for our system, right? They can scatter heat or free electrons. An electron that's trying to travel through your material, it might run into one of these waves of atoms and get scattered by it, right? So it can cause scattering events. The same thing with heat. You've got one, uh, you've got one wave of photons going through your material carrying heat with it and it could run into another one and it could scatter that and go a different direction, right? So these are going to be important for things like thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity, which we'll introduce in a moment, right? Um, okay, what, can, what else can we say about this? When it comes to heat capacity, we generally see curves that look like this. At low temperatures, let's make this a little larger. At low temperatures, they approach zero at this T cubed rate, right? So this rate down here is typically looks something like t cubed if you were to plot um, x cubed or t cubed it has that sort of dependence at very low temperatures and then as you warm it up um, the heat capacity increases but it reaches a limit right it reaches what's called the dulong petite limit right the dulong petite limit is about the value of three times the gas constant right and what's interesting is that all materials, uh, not all materials, many materials uh, exhibit the same phenomenon, right? What this has to do is, is that you can vibrate in three different dimensions, right? X, Y, and Z directions. So it's interesting, once you saturate your three different dimensions of doing vibrations, you no longer can add to your ability to gain heat, right? You're going to gain heat at a constant rate after that. And so that's what this th Dulong Petit limit is of 3R. And what's even more interesting is that even though materials all tend to reach that point if they're solids, um, they reach it at different temperatures because they have what's called different Debye temperatures. So the Debye temperature, when you take the temperature that you're measuring heat capacity at and you divide it by a material's Debye temperature, well, since they have different Debye temperatures, you can make all these materials which had very different behavior line up and stack on top of each other quite easily. Like, for example, take they have diamond here, you've got aluminum, silver, and lead. All of those have different Debye temperatures, 100 Kelvin, 225, 428, 2000 or so, right? But if you take the heat capacity and you plot it against the temperature divided divided by each material's Debye temperature, then they all sort of line up with one another and they start to look pretty interesting there, okay? Now remember, at zero Kelvin, you get no atomic motion, right? That is absolute zero, so all your atoms are frozen in place. They're not moving anymore, okay? Um, all right, so how about this question? When you go above the Debye temperature, is your material still absorbing energy when you raise the temperature? How about that? So remember, heat capacity C equals dQ dt. So we're asking, as you raise the temperature, as this goes up, right, are you still absorbing energy right there? What's it doing? Well, yeah, it is. 
this is also going to increase. You're going to continue absorbing energy. And how do we know that? Well, because this doesn't go to zero. It goes to a constant value. If it went to zero, then that would be the case, but it doesn't. It reaches this constant value of 3R. So yeah, it does keep absorbing energy. It's just that the rate of energy absorption is now constant. It's not changing with temperature.